And if you have a, a way to get to the scriptures, and we all probably do because you're watching this on the internet, and that means that you can Google in another tab of your browser. You can minimize this in the YouTube. I don't know about you, and I'm on uh, a computer. I'm always like figure, fiddling with and figuring out the screens and the best way to have the screens and the spaces and getting everything configured just right. But if you want to get to where we're going to be in the scriptures, you can go to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1, for a message that I'm calling Stir Crazy. It's probably something you can relate to, feelings of being stir crazy. I'm sure there's a lot of that going around, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Philippians 1, Paul, who knew something about the feeling of, of being stir crazy, of being stuck in the same situation, of sort of that mental distress that can come on somebody who's been confined for a long period of time. Paul is a perfect person to tell us what to do in the midst of feeling stir crazy because he wrote the passage of scripture that we're gonna read today from a jail cell, from uh, a confined period of his life where he was literally in chains as he's gonna use that phrase. So uh, as we know, it is a punishment to put someone into solitary confinement. It is a, literally a, a part of our penal system to put people into a situation where they're isolated as, as punishment. And so to deal with the feelings of, of being stir crazy, of losing your mind a little bit in confinement, let's listen to what Paul had to say. Philippians 1, we're going to jump in. Are you with me? What's my title? Yeah, I see that there. Stir crazy. We're talking, we're talking, there's, there's some people talking smack in the comments. That's not fair. You got to be kind to one another. Uh, but Philippians 1, and we got any deer out here? We got to keep, we got to keep a, a sharp eye on the horizon for some, that's, that's a tractor. Okay, it's not a deer. I just saw something flickering in my peripheral vision out there. Incredible. This is not a movie set. This is just life in the last best place. This is the treasure state, y'all. Uh, but we do send our love to those of you at Fresh Life, Jackson, Salt Lake City, uh, Portland, Oregon, all these beautiful parts of the country that we have the, the great privilege of living in. And we are glad to share the beautiful vistas with those of you in different parts of the country. Philippians 1, verse 12 through 21 says, Now I want you to know, brothers, and he means sisters too. He's saying that like mankind, brother kind, brotherhood, sisterhood that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? Come on, someone type in the chat, but what does it matter? The important thing, and that is so crucial, all those things that could be what he's focusing on, fixating on. He instead says, what does it matter? The important thing, the ability to figure that out is the most important thing in this life. What's, what really matters and what doesn't is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we think about someone succumbing to cabin fever or going stir crazy, our minds go to those who have been you know, snowed in. Famously, of course, we picture Jack Nicholson in The Shining. He went there to write. He ended up losing his mind and freezing to death. Uh, we think about Lighthouse, a more modern example, William Defoe and, and Robert Pattison losing their minds. Don't see that movie. It'll, it'll haunt your dreams forever. Uh, we think about you know, situations where people have just sort of had to hunker in 
there was a famous winter uh, that took place in Montana where, where I'm preaching this message. It was uh, the winter of 86 and 87 where historically it snowed every single day from November till the end of February. And cows froze to death in place. Uh, when spring came, they found people who had frozen to death and, and, and really were turned into icicles just yards from their front door, got lost and disoriented in the blizzards and the drifts and the snow. And, and people who, who just were, were, were shut in for that period of time, they, it, it messed with them psychologically. And it's been re reported throughout history, this happens to sailors, this happens to pioneers, this happens to explorers. I came across in my research some uh, various Arctic uh, expeditions that have involved situations where the scientists ended up going bonkers and attacking each other with hammers. Uh, poisoning each other out of, out of some small slight of rivalry, right? He messed with my potato farm, you know, Matt Damon, right? Uh, talking to volleyballs, Wilson, right? Or, or one, those, a couple of those examples were not true. You have to sort out which is which. <laughs> and, uh, but the poisoning and the attacking with hammers is all true. And, and one who got so angry with his, his colleagues, he, he tried to burn his research station to the ground. Uh, the feelings of cabin fever, or, or going stir crazy have even gone to outer space. As in 1968, during the Apollo 7 mission, which was the first Apollo mission to be manned, uh, three astronauts ended up in orbit only to discover one of them had brought with him into quarantine a cold that had been lying dormant in his system and didn't manifest with symptoms. You're like, Levi, too soon. I know, it's a different situation. <laughs> Uh, but until they, imagine being in outer space and realizing you're with someone who is a walking germ. And they couldn't get away from him because they were in this tiny capsule, barely room to navigate, barely room to move. They, they had to, you know, for these 11 days, live in close quarters with someone. And so, of course, all three of them ended up sick. And it's not a big deal to have a cold unless you're in space where fluids don't run. Your nose doesn't run in space, so the only way to deal with the plugged nose was to try and blow it, which of course put pressure on the eardrums and was a risk of rupturing eardrums. So they all got very feisty with each other and snippy, and Mission Control could tell that something was going wrong as there was attitude in every broadcast. And then there was a mutiny. Uh, as they were told and dictated to uh, put their helmets on for relanding, but they knew they couldn't blow their noses uh, while their helmets were on, and so they said no. And so none of these astronauts ever flew again. And, and, and while uh, all, all the previous Apollo missions, uh, they had received distinguished medals for service for their, their work, these three men did not receive them until they were dead. Then posthumously, they gave them the medals. So here's what happens when, when cabin fever strikes, even in space, it can mess with you. All that to say, if you're feeling agitated or irritable, or if you're just kind of really don't messing your circadian rhythms, <coughs> excuse me, are being messed with, uh, that's not abnormal. Give yourself extra grace. What we're dealing with in this time, and I think the reason God had me really focus on this, had us focus together on this, is because it's crazy. And we have to acknowledge that this is peculiar. We're dealing with what is a form of punishment and what, what at, at has cracked some of the best minds and brightest thinkers in the history of the world. But Paul shows us a better way. Paul shows us that it's not only possible, it's also, uh, it's also a better option to choose joy in the midst of what you're facing. He wrote these words that we read in the book of Philippians from a jail cell, most likely Rome. Some suggest it, it could be Ephesus. But what we do know of uh, for sure is the fact that he was in house arrest. You're like, wait, you said he was in jail. Yeah, he was in jail, but he was in jail in a home. Uh, and Acts 28 tells us that this, in, this confinement for him lasted, wait for it, two years. You see, he had appealed to Caesar after he had been arrested on trumped up charges and nearly, by the way, beat to death by a vicious mob. And when he saw that his trial was going nowhere, where he was in Caesarea, he made the decision as a Roman citizen to have his case be viewed by the highest court in that day, the, the, the Supreme Court in the land, which would be to have his case appealed to by Caesar himself. Now, of course, Caesar was a busy guy. So some random Jew from Tarsus who was you know, hated by the Jews in Israel, this was not at the top of the to-do List. So he sat waiting, waiting, waiting for over two years. So just to think about that for a second, Paul, that wrote, who wrote these hope-filled words that we're going to just take a little bit of time 
to really focus in on. And I would encourage you, in this quarantine, live in the prison epistles. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. These are four books of the Bible, all written by this one man who was in jail in this time. He also wrote First and Second Timothy and Titus from death row. So that's a whole nother, a whole nother level of crazy. But this initial uh, time in prison that he eventually would get out of before being arrested again, and then in that prison uh, he would be in a dungeon and then finally be beheaded. Uh, if, if he could live with such hope, if he could live with such courage, if he could live with such kindness in prison, then I think that God could certainly work some of that in our lives. And so what was it that caused Paul to be so kind, that caused him to be so peaceful, that caused him to be so others focused, even while in a house arrest situation where there were shifts of guards coming in and out and he was chained, literally, he was in a house and had some autonomy and some freedom to move about, but there was always a guard there, always someone who, who was there chained to him and, and keeping an eye on him and, and watching over his movements. And the answer that, that, to all three of those is that he had joy joy that allowed him to have peace in the midst of whatever he faced in this life. Joy opened up to him because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For a guy who wrote a letter to people he loved, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, the, the note is not one of self-pity. The note is not one of woe is me. The note of this that you can read as you go through Philippians, as you go through Colossians, as you go through his writings written from a jail cell, there's no sense of nobody knows the troubles that I've seen. And I pray for me, it's so hard here. It's, I, I haven't had a pizza in a month. And, and I'm in Rome. It's the worst. Hashtag first world problem. Like, there's none of that. There's none of, you know, I just, I want to be on the beach. I want to be with my friends. It's just, this is absolute uh, not there. There's no victim mentality. I mean, just, it, it is faith and not discouragement that flashes forth at every turn. And you and I can have that same power when we choose joy. And joy is a choice just like despair is, just like self-pity is or feeling sorry for yourself is. In this time of, of quarantine and confinement, we must choose joy. And there's not a better place on the planet to begin to continue the conversation we began last week as we talked about the responsibility of joy. And that big thought is marking us as we move into 2020. What is this year of vision all about? It's us choosing to see that we always have the choice of joy. Paul uses that word uh, some 18 times in this tiny little four-chapter letter. Think about that. 18 times he uses joy or rejoice or joyful, uh, and, and that's incredible. In fact, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's such a high percentage out of the shortness of this letter that it's, there's more good news in this little book than any of uh, all of the rest of the Apostle Paul's writing. He also uses that exact phrase, good news, or the Greek is euangelion, or you've probably grown up hearing that as the gospel. Uh, Paul uses that eight times, which makes this the book dedicated to good news. Why? Because Paul was focused on the bright side of his situation, as bleak as it was for sure worse than what we're walking through. And so let's pick apart this joy, this, this responsibility that he carried of joy as we talk about the four ingredients that in this passage made his joy so complete. The first is, I see in Paul an unshakable gratitude. An unshakable gratitude. How do you and I, and this, let's just make this real, how do we living in Virginia or living uh, in Massachusetts or living on Facebook in, in Colorado, how do we choose to tap into joy? First of all, we realize that we have the option of an unshakable gratitude. How do you see this? I, I, you actually might say, I, and I didn't men, see the word thank you mentioned anywhere. Well, that's because it's everywhere. In fact, the entirety of the book of Philippians is a thank you note. Why? A little backstory. Paul planted the church in, Philippia, in Philippi. Philippia. I almost said Philippia. That's a made up word. That place is not real. You're like, there's no place called Philippia. Uh, Philippi was a city in Europe where Paul accidentally started a church, meaning he didn't intend to go there. It wasn't in his to-do list to go there. He was actually trying to get to Asia, but nothing was working out right. 
And whenever that's happening, it's always because God is calling you to go somewhere else. He's, he's got something better for you. And so in that situation where he couldn't go to Asia, which is not like it's a bad desire, it was just not the right time for him to go to Asia, God wanted him to go instead to Europe. So God sent him a dream, and through that dream, showed him he was meant to go to Europe, and he ended up in, in Philippi, a city named after Alexander the Great's father. It was a Roman colony. It was an important city. Uh, and there he met a woman named Lydia, and he led her to faith in Christ. And so the church in Europe was born. And the, the church that, that, that blossomed uh, quickly, it, it quickly attracted antagonism and enemies. And Paul ended up in Philippi. You can read this in Acts chapter 16. He ended up in prison. Even there, as, as soon as he started the church, he's, he's in jail. And he chose to respond in that situation with what? Gratitude. And in prison, and that unshakable gratitude led to him praising God and thanking God. And him and his friend Silas were worshiping Jesus at about midnight. And the Bible says their unshakable gratitude was met by a shaking of the prison as an earthquake came. And they were miraculously let out of their bonds. And they chose to not leave when they could have. And the prison guard was going to kill himself because if his prisoners got out, his life was as good as dead. And so he was going to kill himself. Paul said, no, stop it. We're still here. We didn't leave. And they ended up leading their jailer who had just been beating them. Their backs were literally still bloodied because of the beating they had gotten. Uh, but they ended up leading him to faith in Christ. He brought them to his house. They let his entire house uh, hold to faith in Christ. They all ended up getting baptized. They ended up having a great party. The jailer has his wife make some of her famous, famous you know, marinara and, 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 and Alfredo and, you know, rigatoni, whatever they were eating in Philippi back then. And, and it was a Roman colony, and so I'm using my imagination here that it was pasta. But, but, but it, it's really an incredible story. Now, let me just sidebar that for a second. Paul didn't worship God in the jail cell so he would get out. He wasn't thinking, if I worship, there may be an earthquake. He was just, he, they figured they were there for the night. They were just, Paul got arrested so often, it was, it was very rare that he would get released so miraculously. He was just worshiping God, and God chose to respond in the way that he did. Paul was, Paul was probably as surprised as anybody when it happened. And so he had to eventually move on, and he got to go back there uh, later on in his travels and encourage the church and celebrate what they were doing and give them some guidance. And then he comes to this uh, time of confinement, and it's about 12 years later, A.D. 62 or so, and the Philippian church had just put together an offering and sent it to Paul through the use of a servant named Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus had, had risked his life to get this money to Paul, get this resource to Paul. And Paul mentions uh, what Epaphroditus did, and Paul mentions what the Philippian church did through the use of the word called fellowship. Now, you've probably heard the word fellowship used. Maybe if you have a church that does, you know, a meet and greet time. That's fellowship, where you would describe, you know, as many of our Fresh Life groups are doing, being in a Zoom call each week. That's our fellowship. And, and you know, what would normally happen in the church lobbies or, or atriums, that's fellowship, which is true. It, it's not that those things are not fellowship, but the biblical idea always has the idea of a partnership in ministry. And there's always the idea of sponsoring and of sending. It's always the idea of, of someone uh, utilizing the resources they've been given to give themselves over to the gospel going out to more places. So when Paul says, thank you, Philippian church, for your fellowship, what he was saying is the way that you've supported me, because you haven't been called to go out preaching the gospel in every single place physically. You're, you're doing your job. You're, some of you work in this area. Some of you work in that area. Lydia, the first Christian convert in Europe, was a seamstress. She had a passion for fashion. She loved sewing. During this crisis, she'd have been making masks like crazy and donating to the hospitals and first responders and incredible heart for, 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 for clothing. It was just an amazing thing. So she was not called to go to Rome or go to Jerusalem or go to Africa, but she would make money and she would, with her fellowship, support Paul as he did that. The Philippian jailer, he didn't, there's no record of him leaving the military, of him leaving his employment as a soldier. He stayed where he was. He was a warden in a prison working for Caesar, and he was able to be a part of the fellowship of Paul's ministry. He chipped in to give that money that Epaphroditus carried to bring to Paul to meet his needs, which is, by the way, how he was able to have food to eat for a prisoner had to basically somehow come up with the money 
to feed themselves. Caesar wasn't going to pay for you to eat. And so Paul was literally living off of the generosity of the churches that he had started who cared for and wanted to be a part of the fellowship of what God was doing. And so they partnered with him. And the entire book of Philippians is his thank you note. Now, how incredible is it that the dude is in prison and still cranking out his correspondence, still cranking out his thank you notes? And like I said, the entirety of the tone is all about them. It's about how they're doing. It's about him praying for them and caring for them and wanting to support them. We see in this, there's a, there's a spirit of gratitude. Now, what's, what's amazing about this is I told you Paul's life is one that's supported by joy. But joy is fostered and fueled by gratitude. In fact, there's a connection in 1 Thessalonians 5 where Paul says that it's God's will for us to rejoice always. So it's God's will right now in this pandemic, in this situation, that you rejoice always. He didn't say rejoice when things are going well or rejoice when you feel like you're in control or rejoice when you feel like the people around you are being kind to you. He said rejoice always. This is God's will. But in the very next breath, he tells us how it's possible to rejoice always. He says, in everything, give thanks. Rejoice always. In everything, give thanks. I know a lot of you right now watching this, like me, are dealing with situations where you're like, man, I don't feel joyful. I don't, I don't feel any joy to the world. There's none of that right now in what I'm dealing with. My kids, my husband, the situation at work, the reality of unemployment, the uncertainty of the future, all the economy, and I lost my graduation, and this was stolen from me, and this was taken from me. I was picking up some takeout food the other day for our family, and the, the, the server was, 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 who was bravely there in that restaurant. And thank you to those of you who still show up at the restaurants all across the world who are still doing that. She said, uh, I was supposed to be in Mexico right now. Hopefully I'll get to it one of these days. And there was just a real trailing off of her voice. I think we all can, to some degree, think of something that was cruelly taken from our hands. And maybe it was not a, a Mexican beach vacation. Maybe it was someone you love. Maybe to the COVID-19 virus or maybe to, to something else. But you know the feeling of, 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 of joylessness that's come because of something that was taken from you and, and snatched from you. And in that situation, Paul says, when you don't feel joyful, the key is gratitude. The key is to, in everything. He doesn't say for everything, give thanks, but in everything. For we deal with things that are not good and we're not to be thankful for, but in those things we can choose to be grateful, to show gratitude, and that gratitude will help us to tap into our joy. Paul, as he gives thanks, is modeling for us. You go, how, how, Paul, do you have a thank you note full of joy? It's because he was writing a thank you note that he now is walking in joy. So what perhaps this week could go down in your journal as something to be thankful for in the midst of this? And we know that gratitude releases in us the very same chemicals that come in our bodies when we take uh, antidepressants. And so to think about what powerful tools you have at your disposal to walk in joy by being grateful. The second thing I see in Paul here is I see an unselfish pragmatism. An unselfish pragmatism. When you're pragmatic, you're very detached emotionally from, from how things are, are, are being affected, and you're able to make decisions based on benefit. Now, stay with me here. If you're like me and you're very pragmatic, you are tactical and always are calculating. And at worst, this can come across as cold, and you're able to appraise situations based on how uh, they can benefit you and, and how you see outcome. And you can end up being, being rather merciless. You can end up being rather savage. When you're not guarded, you can become calculating when you're just purely pragmatic. And to be able to look at situations and, and in just a quick moment calculate uh, the best way to, to get the advantage out of, out of a situation. But what I see in Paul here is unselfish pragmatism, which does feel a bit like an oxymoron, but, but you'll see it's actually a, a truly powerful thing. To be pragmatic about what he's facing, he's looking at it to see what is the benefit here. He's calculating what is the benefit of me being in this situation but he's doing so in a way that has no ego. There's no trace of I. There's no trace of, of me. He, in fact, says, like, hey, look, if I'm here, can't do anything about that. And I worshiped, and God didn't choose to get me out of it, which I know he can. 
and uh, he did that before. So if, I, if, if God wanted me out of this prison, he would, he would do it. I've watched him do it. So nothing's stopping God from getting me out of it. Therefore, he must have a reason for sending me into it. And see his pragmatic mind begin to work and go, hey, look, if you sent me in here, I want to make sure and accomplish the mission. And so he tells him, and I love this. This is so powerful. I really hope and pray that God can get this deep down in our souls. Are you still with me, YouTube? Are you still watching on Facebook? Is this, am I preaching good? Paul says here, I want you to know, dear brethren, that the things that have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I want you to know, as I've assessed this whole dynamic, I know you're concerned about me, about me but don't cry for me, Argentina. Right? You like that? I see things that God's doing. I, I, I know you think, oh, no, the great apostle Paul, the traveling preacher who can't travel, thus probably can't preach. I know you think this has locked up the gospel. But, y'all, the word of God cannot be chained. I've had more opportunities to preach the gospel in here than I could possibly imagine. It was always his dream to go to Rome. Now, he did not ever see it happen in this way, but he is in Rome. And guess what? Every six hours, a new Roman person gets chained to him. I always wanted to preach the gospel of Romans. Hey, Bill. And how, how you doing? Oh, man, you know, the things. That, well, let's talk about that. The guy couldn't get it. Talk about a captive audience, right? You're here volitionally. Paul had people that he got to talk to who had no choice as he communicating God, communicated God's words to them. And he says, it's an incredible thing. As, as you read it, he says in verse 13, as a result of my being sent into this prison, that's why he wasn't a victim mentality. He was a victor sent by King Jesus into this house arrest. You were sent into this quarantine. You're sent into this pandemic. God has a plan for you in the midst of what you're facing. He says, as a result of me being in these chains, which I could go, oh, these terrible chains, or I'd go, thank you, Jesus, for chains that, 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 that lock me to hurting people who, who need six hours with the Apostle Paul, who's been with Jesus. He says, as a result of that, most of them have ended up figuring out my chains are in Christ, the whole palace guard. And that's a technical phrase that actually means Praetorian guard. Which, if you see the movie uh, Gladiator, which you should, because it's the best movie it's ever made, it's a fact. You, I don't have to agree with me. You could be wrong. Black Hawk Down would be second. Braveheart probably third. Shawshank Redemption would be fourth. <laughs> and Dumb and Dumber would be fifth. All right, so rounding out the list. Totally redeemed myself, all right? So, so here's, the, here's the beautiful thing. If you saw Gladiator, let me know in the comments which of those are your favorites, or if there's another, uh, probably don't go down the rabbit trail, because then it would just digress, and no one listening to the rest of the message. Because it's just like, oh, my favorite movie is Dumbo, you know? OK, so, but the cartoon one, not the new one. That was just creepy. All right, so in Gladiator, the Praetorian guards were the ones who were assigned to take Maximus's life when Commodus killed his father, and then Maximus spurned the idea of serving under uh, Commodus. And so it was the Praetorians who were then assigned to execute him. But that didn't work so good because sometimes the frost makes the blade stick. And Maximus knew that, but they did not. And so it was, uh, it was I, I'm sorry, I'm getting very distracted because I love that movie. So yeah, 300 is definitely on that list too, Kevin G. Lowe. I uh, can't recommend anybody watch it, but it was great. All right, so because <laughs> I am a Christian, all right? And I have standards and values and morals. So uh, the Praetorian Guard, there were 9,000 of them. They were the most elite out of all the soldiers in the, emperor, in the empire. And they were paid double, and they were, it was a respected position. And Paul's leading them to faith in Jesus Christ. I like how the message translation puts it in verse uh, 20 when he says, they didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Come on, somebody. Paul says, they thought they were going to shut me up when they put me behind bars. Turns out they were turning on the PA system for my microphone to preach the gospel to some of the most influential people in the entirety of the Roman Empire, a.k.a. the empire on planet Earth at the time. And the infectious spread, I know too soon, I gotta, I gotta stop it with those kind of words. The spread of the kind of hope that would end up happening when someone would get assigned to Paul's house arrest 
for just a couple. Of, they probably had to start, you know, get someone else in here, right? And they're like, that guy gets saved too. And, and, and this just so went from person to person to person that I'm going to just flash ahead to the end. Chapter 4, verse 22, when he's signing off and he's about to pull a seacrest out, he says, all the saints greet you. Oh, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Paul's two-year ministry stint in the slammer ended up leading people to faith who worked in Caesar's household. We don't know if that means family members or if it means his cook and his butler and the person who fed him grapes when he was lying out by the pool. But we know that people were coming to faith in Christ all throughout. Why? Why? Paul saw what you need to see, a sort of unselfish pragmatism. Hey, I'm in this situation, and I could cry about it, and I could be sad about it. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with either of those things. But I'm not going to live there. I'm going to eventually go, okay, how can I actually look at this outside of myself and say objectively, what is the good in it? What's to be redeemed in it? I'm in, I'm in chains. Yeah, but there's two sides to every chain. And I could look at my side and go, oh, darn. Or I could look at the other side of my chain and go, there's someone else on the other end of this line, and I have a choice. And when Paul realized that, he realized that we always have a choice, a choice to rejoice. I could be sad about this or I could rejoice in it. And the power of joy, listen, the power of joy, and I think the reason God's trying to call his bride back to joy is that what happens to you no longer has to control you. So there's an invincibility that flows from joy. When you have joy, you have strength. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord becomes your strength. But it wasn't just being in prison that Paul saw pragmatically and unselfishly was a good for other people. It was the results of the revival that was breaking out, as in Rome or in Ephesus, wherever this took place, that people were getting saved. It, he says, it caused other people to begin to preach the gospel. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But he says some of them did so with bad motives. Some of them did so, in fact, uh, with, with a wrong heart. Maybe they, they heard of the recognition Paul was getting or the, the renown, and they kind of wanted that. And so he was hearing word that some people were bad-mouthing him and preaching the gospel. Now, they weren't preaching the gospel wrong. They were just preaching the gospel with wrong motives, which would be easy for him then to, to think, oh, the, how, how dare they? Instead, he goes, again, remember, we're talking about pragmatism. If I'm going to look at it pragmatically. If they're preaching Christ with, with bad hearts, as long as Christ is getting preached. What a big man he was that even in that situation, he chose to see the good in it. And I think there's power there because we're not going to live in a world of fault finding and motive inspecting because when you're difficult to offend, you become easy for God to bless. And Paul was difficult to offend. He goes, eh, Jesus is getting preached. What do I care? Difficult to offend easy for God to bless, bigness of spirit, walking on a higher level in joy. Let's in our homes, let's in our lives, let's in our, our co-working situations where everyone's kind of on pins and needles, right? Everyone's, everyone's starting to feel like, did you give me the cold? Did you, right? The, 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 the Apollo 7 dynamic of, of just sort of like wanting to get snippy with each other. Let's, let's just believe that God has a blessing for us as we choose joy. The third thing I see in Paul's tone and spirit that tapped into this beauty is there was an unvarnished confidence. Unvarnished. Write that down. Unvarnished confidence. What do I mean by that? I mean, he was confident as to how this was all going to play out, even though he didn't know the particulars. But he, it was an unvarnished confidence, meaning there was rough edges. And if you rubbed your hand on it the wrong way, you'd get a splinter. It was not beautiful and, and manicured. His confidence uh, wasn't, you know, glossed over. He wasn't putting a nice face on an ugly thing. And that is so crucial that you understand that the hope you're meant to have in this situation isn't meant to be one that's overly sanitized to where you have a naive or, or somewhat, you know, unrealistic sort of expectation for the level of difficulty inherent in the hope that Jesus gave you to walk in. We talked a few months back. Some of you might remember if you were uh, with us early on in the year as we were preaching, we referenced uh, Admiral James Stockdale. 
uh, from uh, the Vietnam War. He was a prisoner of war for eight years, and he endured like 20 savage beatings in Vietnam, and he eventually came home and, and, and was, was decorated and, and celebrated, and, and rightly so. I mean, this guy was so incredible. He refused to even be weaponized because they were trying to use uh, prisoners of war uh, in propaganda videos, recording them saying, see, you're fine, I'm great, everything's fine, to, to show home a rosy view of how things were going. So he would, and this is incredible, he would give himself beatings at times if he was looking too pretty so that when they tried to film him, it was a more realistic picture of what was actually being done at home. And it, just incredible. And he, he led the men in, in the prisoner of war camp and helped them develop systems of Morse code and communicating with each other creatively to keep the, the morale alive. Um, but what he said was that, and, I, and we referenced this incredibly, of, of that quarantine that they were dealing with in the POW camps uh, was that the ones who oftentimes died the soonest and didn't make it out of that quarantine, out of that house arrest, were the ones who had sort of this optimistic, cheerful, we're all going to be OK, we'll be home by Valentine's Day. We'll be home by Easter. No, no, we're going to be home by, by, by Mother's Day. And those who tried to rally each other by going, it's OK, it's going to be over quickly. We're going to be fine. We're going to be good, which, which we would think, oh, that's probably good that they had that sort of like, you know, overly varnished sense of, of, of confidence and optimism. He said those were the ones who died the soonest. Because that marker they had set as we're going to get out of this soon and easily, don't worry about it. We're going to let's just think positive here. When that day would come and go, they would eventually grow jaded and grow cynical and, and eventually despair. And so they were eaten up. The ones who made it out of the situation alive were the ones who said, it doesn't really matter when we get out of this, and it doesn't really matter how hard it's going to be, because it's probably going to be terrible. We are going to make it out of this, and we will never give up. And those were the ones who survived and came home. And, he, and I, I shared this quote during that, that series, Not Quickly Broken, where he said, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. And I love that, that tension, which Jim Collins calls the Stockdale paradox. And that paradox is that we're honest and open to give the unvarnished picture of, you know what, this is awful and this does suck. Whatever we're facing, be it bereavement or be it unemployment or being some disease, you say, this is terrible. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to try and make you think, oh, no, it's going to be OK. We're going to be gumdrops and lollipops in, in just a few months, that there's a reality to the, to the situation being bleak. But at the same time, that there's a grit and an absolute confidence that we are going to make it through this. Those who can exhibit that are the ones who are going to lead us into the future in the coming days. In fact, as we look backwards in our country, it was that that really was at the heartbeat of our first president that we ever had. I was reflecting in my notes and underlinings that I had done in a book by David McCullough called 1776 just a while ago uh, that I would highly recommend to you if you've never read it, if you're looking for some quarantine reading. 1776, David McCullough, he says this about President George Washington, who at that point was a general in the Revolutionary War. He said that Washington was not a brilliant strategist or a tactician. He was not even really a gifted orator. He was not an intellectual. But he never forgot was it what was at stake, and he never gave up. And his cardinal strength was seeing things as they were, not as he wished them to be. Do you hear that? It's the Stocktail Paradox. He, he wasn't a great speaker or even that great of a, of, a, of a strategist. But he never gave up, and he never pretended things that were terrible weren't. He didn't see things as he wished they were. He saw them as they were, but still didn't give up anyway. That is the key to joy, church. Come on, Fresh Life, the strength of the Lord that's going to bring us through this storm and the next one, which may even be worse and may be more complicated. Jesus said there's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilences. So this that, that we're dealing with is what Jesus said was going to be uh, happening on this earth. The earth is in labor pains, groaning. There's a, there's, a, there's a brokenness to this world. Jesus is on the throne, but he has not tipped over the subsequent dominoes that will unleash the life that he came out of the grave with to the rest of 
this planet and to our bodies because he's seeking to win the hearts of men and women and boys and girls until that day. And we can do that. We can click the share button right now and be a part of him getting more hope to more people. He said the gospel will be preached to the whole world before the end comes. We can be a part of the fulfillment of those prophecies, doing something so simple as posting a status update to our Instagram story. And God can use the simplest gesture that you use as the five loaves and two fishes put into his hands to feed the multitudes in this sick world. We're not victims in this crisis. We are hospital agents sent into a sick world on behalf of the great physician, Jesus, who came to seek and to save that which is lost. And so we have to have a confidence, yes, but one that's unvarnished, one with rough edges that says, I'm not certain what's going to go down, but I know this, my king wins in the end. And Paul, Paul has that all over this passage. Paul says, I don't even know if I'm going to make it out of here alive. And I don't even know which I actually want to happen. I love his honesty. We didn't get to read it. But he goes on later and says, you know, I, I may die, I may live. And quite frankly, they both sound great, you know, because if I, if I live, I'm going to serve you. And if I die, well, that's pretty wicked awesome being with Jesus. And Paul at, this, at that point had already been to heaven one time, so he knew that was rad. So he didn't spend a lot of time on that. He just said to be with Christ would be far better than staying here. But what I want to do, what I need to do, he says, is stay on this earth. So, so the sacrifice is not going to heaven. We think of death as some horrible thing. That's not, this, to, to Paul, the sacrifice wouldn't be going to be with Jesus. The sacrifice would be staying here. So to some of you who have ever walked with, you know, maybe it'd be better if I were, if, if I were dead or you've had these thoughts bombarded, let me just tell you something. The sacrifice is staying. And the living sacrifice that God's called us to live every day of is to choose to stay here on this earth. Yeah, it would be amazing to go to heaven. Let's just go to heaven tomorrow. No, no, that, that's amazing. But we're called to sacrifice. Your body, which was paid for by Jesus, uh, his blood that dripped down to the ground, it bought you. So now you're to live a, a living sacrifice. For you to take the easy way out and go to heaven would be to abandon your post. You're needed here. You're called here. The sacrifice is staying. The joy would be going. So choose to live a life of a living sacrifice because you are not your own. You were bought at a price and your body and your heart and your mind and your soul are God's and he wants to use you on this planet. So no, it won't be easy, but you can choose to have an unvarnished confidence. Now you might be thinking, hold on, Levi, what about where Paul says, I know, verse 19, that because of your prayers, I'm going to get out of here. He says, because you're praying and God's going to help me with his spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. Do you, do you think he's saying this is going to turn out like Acts 16 and I'm going to get out of the Philippian jail Only now it's going to be the Ephesian or the Roman jail? No, no, that's not at all what he's saying. The word deliverance in the Greek is the word salvation, soteria, which is why theologians describe studying salvation as soteriology. I know you, I'm losing some of you. You're like, whoa, whoa, glazing over, glazing over. Hold on, hold on, stay with me. When we talk about someone getting saved, like if you gave your life, if you're like one of the hundreds of people who we've seen just last weekend at Easter get, make decisions to give their life to Jesus Christ, that's called salvation. Now, salvation is not full or final in any one phase. There are, they say, three phases to salvation. There's salvation in the past. That's justification, where you believe in Jesus and he justifies you like a judge would. Bang, not guilty. Bang, paid in full. That's what happened because of Jesus' death on the cross. The moment you trust in Christ, your past is completely forgiven. But your future has a salvation to it as well, because when you do eventually uh, go to be with Jesus, there will be a salvation from anything that's ever bad again, anything that defiles, anything that's horrible and hard and wicked. That's still salvation too. So there are aspects of your salvation that are not yet uh, a part of your day-to-day -day life. You will experience that. There's a middle aspect too. And the present form of salvation is where you're saved from the power of sin day in and day out as you become more and more like Jesus. So where the past is justification, the future is, just, is glorification, the present is what the Bible refers to as sanctification, which is where you're being more and more refined, purified, you're getting stronger, you're, you're getting more spiritual abs, you're developing that spiritual six-pack because of all that work you're doing, walking with Jesus. When Paul says, I know this will turn out for my deliverance, he was saying, I know that this either is going to end up with me being glorified and going to heaven, or I become more like Jesus. The point is, no matter how this ends, I win. I become more like Christ in a crisis, or 
I end up going to be with him. And so the problem is, what exactly? Unvarnished confidence. The fourth and final is I see in Paul, I wish we could take longer and to talk about how that courage spread out to the other soldiers, by the way. I wish we could talk about how even other Christians were emboldened who had been quiet about their witness. When they saw that Paul could do it in, in a jail cell, they started doing it too. I wish I could tell you that when you hurt with hope, you can help other people because they'll begin to rise up and take their platforms, take their microphones, because they're watching God work in your life. I, I hope you understand that it's not just about what you're called to do. It's about other eyes that are watching you. Yeah. As you walk with Jesus, your little children, your friends, and other people are looking at you. How are they going to respond to this? What are they doing? And as they watch you crush it in faith, in joy, it will give them courage as well. The fourth, because I don't have time to talk about any of that, is Paul had, why did he have joy, church? There was an unambiguous definition of success. This is leadership 101. Define the when. Define the why. You, in your organization, whether it's through Zoom calls or through FaceTimes, text, mission statements, published values, or any, in any work of leadership, always trying to bring it back to why. Why are we doing this? Why did we get into this in the first place? What is the, what is the win here? What is the goal? How am I doing on time here? Oh, we're doing good. Do you have anywhere to go? We're, we're at home. Where, where, where do we have to be, right? We always, I just have to make sure I don't preach till the next worship experience because the 11 o'clock will be starting just a little bit and they got to get into the waiting room. But, but, but are, we, are we still good? Are you still tracking with me? Is everybody still okay? Can you know, let me know in the, the chat that you're still, you're still awake? We didn't go back to sleep. You go back to the oven for a second cinnamon roll. All right, grab one for me as well because that sounds delicious. An unambiguous definition of success is where there's a, a laser-like focus on why we're here and what we're, do what we're doing. I was inspired this week listening to a conversation between Simon Sinek and Scott Harrison. One is a prolific author and speaker, and the other leads Charity Water, one of our outreach partners. And in the conversation, uh, Simon told a story I'd never heard before about uh, former CEO of Nike, Phil Knight, who at one point was giving an address and he was trying to really rally back to the just do it, which has to us become, you know, just like the 23 logo and the, the Air Jordan, you know, just, just an emblem, just something you see on the wall all the time. But you could tell in this speech that it was visceral for Phil. It was in his, it was in his blood. As he uh, said to this crowded convention center, use your imagination. He was in a room with lots of people. He said, everyone stand up if you like to run. Whole room stands up. I would have been seated, by the way. I do not like to run. And uh, he said, okay, uh, how about if you run every single week? Uh, stay standing, everyone else sit down. You know, some of the people sat down at the edge, like, okay, I ran one time last year. Uh, I didn't realize it was, do I actually like to run currently? Like, I just like the idea of running. I like running clothes and running shoes, right? Uh, athleisure. And, uh, and as, as the illustration continued, he said, okay, how about you run two to three times a week? Stay standing. A few more people sat down. Now there's some hardcore runners, you know, kind of excited about this. And he says, all right, how about if you run every day? Well, there's, there's very few, you know, now, but he ends with this. How many of you run if it's raining, run if it's snowing, run if it's freezing, run if it's, there's a tornado going by, you're running. There's like, like seven people in this crowded room. And he says, we at Nike are the ones standing under the lamppost cheering you on. That is what just do it means. All right. There's an organization that has a cause and an unambiguous definition of success. They are there to champion the diehard so that they can continue to do what they were born to do. Ah, are you not entertained? Okay, we're back to that here. Paul, to me, has that level of personal brand clarity. How does he have joy? How is he not being shaken by these difficult situations? Because he says, my earnest expectation the one thing, which the Greek literally, that I, I can't even describe to you how strong that is. What, what it means when he says my earnest expectation is he says I'm on tiptoes and I'm giving myself a kink neck trying to see and make sure it happens. I'm focused resolutely on one thing more than anything else. And he says this, that Christ would be magnified in my body. Whether I live or die, I could care less so long as I do so, bringing glory, honor, fame, and renown to the name of Jesus. 
Like they're worried about Paul. Are you going to get out of there? He's like, what do I care if I live or die? Is this not incredible? So long as I bring glory to Jesus. He, 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 he sees his personal life and his body and his resources, everything he has, as a theater. And I, that resonates with me because my family's been watching all these productions that have been released to YouTube. Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And last night we were watching Phantom of the Opera. Andrew Lloyd Webber, he's releasing Broadway plays for anybody to watch. And Jen and I were saying, like, this is actually better than going to the theater. You have better seats. You're not, you're not like stuffy. You're not full of, you know, other people's personal space being violated. And we were watching, you know, Phantom of the Opera is here inside my mind, right? And this whole amazing thing. And, and Clover and Daisy are like eating popcorn, loving it. And, and we were watching a theater. And to think about Paul viewing his life as a theater. And the production is what? Well, it's Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm -hmm. Paul's body he views as a theater, and all he wants to depict is that Jesus Christ is the superstar. Whether I live or die, nothing matters to me more than Jesus Christ being glorified. Mm -hmm. And he knew that the thing that would more than anything accomplish that is for him to live a life of joy. Brand advertisement on lockdown for him if the castle of his heart, which had the king in, in residence there, had joy flying high as a flag declaring to the world that someone on death row, that someone in chains, that someone about to be decapitated, or someone who was doing really well, still lived a life giving honor to Jesus. He knew the secret. The secret to being abased or abounding. Having money, not having money. Having enough to eat, being hungry, preaching to thousands, or telling the gospel to one dude who needs Jesus too in this house. To getting to fly around the world doing what we're doing or get to love your family well. The secret to those things is this. Jesus Christ can give me the power to do all things. So for me, to live is Christ. To die, that's gain. Mm -hmm. Paul had a very unambiguous definition of success for his life. And what a tragedy to win in life at the wrong things, to spend your whole life climbing the proverbial ladder only to discover at the end that it was propped up against the wrong wall. There are so many things in this world that if they are your definition of success, that right now you can't control them, can you? Right now, and really in all of life, we're, 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 we're so fragile we're so frail, we're so easily prevented. It just shows you how quickly everything can change. But this is the, beauty, the beautiful thing. If your number one thing is Christ and his glory, that can never be taken from you, even if your life is. Mm -hmm. So what to do when you're feeling stir crazy? Stir like crazy. Stir Hebrews 10, 24, one another up to do love and good works. Stir, 2 Timothy 1, 6, up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Stir, 2 Peter 3, 1, by way of reminder, your pure minds because of the scriptures you've heard. Stir, Exodus 35, 21, your heart up to be willing with spirit to give offerings to the Lord's work, which we've learned is fellowship. When you feel like you're being stirred like crazy, which Paul even had other people trying to stir him to craziness, it, it actually says that in verse 17. They were trying to stir up trouble for me. Stir your own heart up to do what God's called you to do. And no matter what happens, he'll be glorified and you will walk in joy. I want to end this message by pointing you to the sunrise that could save your life. I was watching an interview this week, and in the interview, it, it was brought up that in the early 1900s, there was someone who, from New York City, moved to Paris to learn the art of making statues and to perfect his skill. He cobbled together the resources possible to get on a ship over to, to France. And while he was there, um, his name Augustus Saint Gardens. What a beautiful name. Augustus Saint Gardens. He... Uh, found himself making statues and, and, and working to hone his craft, but he was struggling with depression and struggling with anxiety and struggling with uh, a, a great sense of difficulty. Maybe he was being cloistered up in this workshop, you know, working on these, these statues day in and day out. And one night in despair, in the darkness of the, 
of the Parisian night, he ended up walking out in the street and decided, I'm going to kill myself. And he came to this bridge, and it was dark, and he felt cold, he felt alone. And he walked to the middle of the bridge. It was a, a famous bridge called the Bridge of the Arts. And he stood at the middle of the bridge. This is, I'm watching this on YouTube, and decided, I'm going to throw myself into these cold waters below where I'll perish. And just as he was about to, he, kn- he saw a little flicker of light on the horizon and realized it was a sunrise. And he stopped what he was doing and stood there and watched as the, the sun rose, filling the city with light. The Louvre, which was in the distance, became illuminated and began to glow. The whole river began to change. And he literally said these words, standing there at the bridge, I don't want to die. I want to live. And he walked away from that bridge, a changed man. The light and the hope of light, morning, dawn, changed his perspective. Now, I don't know if you're dealing with, with, with dark thoughts like that or just anxiety or difficulty or, or a sense of hopelessness. But what I do know is that in your situation, the sunrise could change your life. And if you've never made the decision that Paul made, you can. This morning, God is where you are. He's with you. He loves you. He wants to change you. He wants to save you. He wants to bring the sunrise of life over your life, to bring you hope, to give you peace so you can live with purpose. And I'm praying you would make that decision, the most important yes of your whole life. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for every single person on Facebook, on Church Online, on on YouTube. I thank you that no one's here by accident. Even those watching this on the podcast later or on Fresh Life TV, and they just feel alone. They're starting to feel stir crazy. But thank you that you're the Lord who gives and takes away. And even in the midst of when you're taking away, you're seeking to bless us and use us. I thank you that there is salvation in your name. So I first ask that your church would respond and and continue to walk in joy. Help us to be those great examples. Focus like a laser on what matters most. And for anybody here now who doesn't know you, who needs that salvation, I pray that you would help them to see through your spirit that they can't save themselves, but if they trust in you, that you will save them. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, as I give this invitation, if you'd like to be forgiven, like to be made new on the inside, we talked about what salvation looks like. Every sin you've ever committed could be forgiven. Jesus would come to take up residence inside your heart, and he would open you up to a life of joy, confidence, no matter how unvarnished the reality is of what we have to face. With head bowed and eye closed, if you would like to receive Jesus, say this prayer with me. Say it out loud. God will hear you. Mean it in your heart. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I know I've done wrong. I pray you'd forgive me. Come into my heart and make me new. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, Now, still praying and still in an attitude of devotion, I want to give you a moment to act on it because I believe there's power in nailing it down as a symbol. I'm going to ask that in just a moment when I count to three, you would raise up a hand right there in your apartment, your living room, your kitchen, your bedroom. Raise up your hand when I get to three as a way of saying, this is real, this just happened. I'm giving my life to Jesus. One, two, three. Three, shoot your hands up, shoot your hands up. God sees you, God sees you. Every single one of you making this decision, this is real. This just happened. This is important. 